I solemnly swear that I am up to no good. Hey, everybody, I'm Alistair Stevens, and welcome to the fifth session in the third season of Dear Mr. Potter, in which we delve into chapters nine and 10 of Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. In tonight's reading, we hit, in a sense, the halfway point of the book. In another sense, in a more structural sense, we'll hit the halfway point next week. But hey, no one ever said that the structure of Prisoner of Azkaban was conventional. We talked a little back in our first session about the long, slow, drawn-out build that this novel gets. It feels like we've been at Hogwarts for nothing but a minute, and yet here we are, almost halfway through the book, and from certain perspectives, halfway through the plot of this story. It is going to be a wild ride tonight. Uh, we get some of the high points, I think, of the entire series contained within this reading. Certainly, the introduction of my favorite magical artifact that J.K. Rowling ever created. But we also get one of the weirdest and most difficult to parse in some senses and justify in other senses seen in the entire series. More on that later. As ever, you can contribute live here in the YouTube chat along with Angela and Nikki and Gildarts Winters and Rohit and Eric and Becca and Jamie. Brian is with us tonight having done sterling work and caught up on all of Dear Mr. Potter within, I guess, the last two weeks, Brian. Has it just been two weeks? But you have been just, just uh, dedicated in your desire to catch up and be with us live here. It's going to be a really fun discussion and we will waste no time at all because, as I say, we have quite a, uh, quite a lot of material to cover. Let's begin with Chapter 9, Grim Defeat, and our first slide. Here, in the wake of Sirius Black's attack on the fat lady, our knowledge now that he is somewhere in Hogwarts, Dumbledore takes extraordinary measures. Professor Dumbledore sent all the Gryffindors back to the Great Hall, where they were joined ten minutes later by the students from Hufflepuff, Ravenclaw, and Slytherin, who all looked extremely confused. The teachers and I need to conduct a thorough search of the castle, Professor Dumbledore told them as Professors McGonagall and Flitwick closed all doors into the hall. I'm afraid that, for your own safety, you will have to spend the night here. I want the prefects to stand guard over the entrances to the hall, and I am leaving the head boy and girl in charge. Any disturbances should be reported to me immediately, he added to Percy, who was looking immensely proud and important. Send word with one of the ghosts. Professor Dumbledore paused, about to leave the hall, and said, Oh yes, you'll be needing... One casual wave of his hand, and the long tables flew to the edges of the hall and stood themselves against the walls. Another wave, and the floor was covered with hundreds of squashy purple sleeping bags. Sleep well, said Professor Dumbledore, closing the door behind him. <laughs> Rob says, Percy really finds ways to be awful, even in the face of tragedy sometimes. And Leo Bill 88 kind of stands in opposition to that, though not necessarily complete opposition with the observation that Percy is great! Exclamation point. Um... We talked a little about Percy last time here in Dear Mr. Potter, and yes, he is continuing his tradition of kind of allowing arrogance to stand in the way of, I don't know, goodness, or at least a straightforward goodness, but nonetheless, here he is at least serving his school, as he always does, and we should perhaps note that public service, service to Hogwarts, and in more general terms, service to the wizarding community, does seem to be at least as ingrained in Percy's character as raw, naked, Slytherin-like ambition. Uh, as Josh observes, Percy is a little too ambitious for his own good. Yes, Aaron notes, you know you're a master wizard if you thought to learn a summon hundreds of sleeping bag spell. Once again, we see that a lot of the constraints placed upon magic within the world of Harry Potter seem to be applicable primarily, if not exclusively, to students at Hogwarts. You learn the spells through the incantation and the work of the wand, but ultimately you are going to be liberated from those constraints, at least if you are destined to be a great Dumbledorean wizard. So this is the consequence of Sirius Black's intrusion into Hogwarts and the attack upon the fat lady, his desire to get into the Gryffindor common room. And we see here the dimensionality of that response, or certainly we will see over the course of the next couple of slides, the dimensionality of that response. Dumbledore is upset with the Dementors, the necessity of the Dementors at Hogwarts, and yet in the face of direct conflict, in the, in the face of a direct intrusion into the grounds and even the castle itself of Hogwarts, he takes absolutely the necessary steps. Oftentimes Dumbledore is criticized for being a little out of touch. He is criticized for perhaps being a little reckless with the lives and well-being of his students, but here we see him taking what is, I think, an absolutely appropriate response, marshalling the entire staff and faculty of Hogwarts in order to search for Black while making sure that the children themselves are protected. And there is a sense in which I've been thinking a lot 
over the last week of the purpose and the place of Prisoner of Azkaban, and in a sense, the purpose and the place of Goblet of Fire. I'm not going to talk about Goblet of Fire, certainly not in spoilerific terms, though there are a couple of opportunities to throw forward to Goblet of Fire based on the uh, the uh, features of the chapters that we're discussing tonight, not least of all the introduction of one Cedric Diggory, who will be significant later in that, uh, in that fourth book in the series. But I've been thinking about the ways in which the boarding school adventure story has evolved, and we are reaching something very like the apotheosis of the boarding school adventure story. We are now as deeply enmeshed in boarding school adventure as we will perhaps ever be. The notion that in the face of an outright attack by a known mass murderer and the most infamous criminal in the wizarding world, we should instead have, instead of, you know, evacuating Hogwarts instead of sending these children, I don't know, home, we should instead have a giant sleepover in the Great Hall. This is absolutely consistent with our perspective on Hogwarts as a school first, but also as a world unto itself. It is still behaving as though it is a world unto itself. And that is going to reach its absolute pinnacle in the Goblet of Fire. By the time we get to the Triwizard Tournament, we are going to be dealing with, with school life as at, at its height, school life as a functional uh, replacement for all life. And then later in the series, that is going to fall away. After Goblet of Fire, we're pretty much going to be done with boarding school adventure. At that point, even into Order of the Phoenix, we are not going to see Hogwarts as a safe place. We're not going to see Hogwarts as a world unto itself, which it still, blessedly, thankfully, is. We're still preserving innocence here. And we're preserving innocence with a certain amount of information, with a certain amount of knowledge, with a certain amount of care here, but the children are still resolutely children. We are not marshalling these, these troops. We're not, you know, taking the, the fifth and sixth and seventh years off to go and battle Sirius Black or even to search for Sirius Black. No, no, no. The children will be protected and they will be protected, of course, under the aegis of the head boy and the head girl. Thus, we are kind of embodying and representing, and also, you know, in effect, doubling down on the notion of Hogwarts as a school, as a world unto itself. It's a pretty strong play here from J.K. Rowling, and it's the kind of play that actually does give a certain amount of credence to the idea that she had the entire shape of the series worked out. Because scenes like this, and certainly when I get to the Triwizard Tournament during our discussion of Goblet of Fire, I'm going to have a lot to say on this specific topic, but scenes like this do speak to the idea of a vanishing and, and transitory and unsustainable vision of Hogwarts, that Harry is outgrowing this, this perspective on Hogwarts. We've talked about that throughout our discussion of Prisoner of Azkaban, but in a sense, Hogwarts is being left behind by the world, by the imminent return of he who shall not be named. More on that later. So this is our setup. The professors are going to search. I'm afraid that for your own safety, you will have to spend the night here, as Dumbledore says. I want the prefects to stand guard over the entrances to the hall. I'm leaving the head boy and girl in charge. So the kind of transition of temporal authority to the prefects and the head boy and head girl, specifically as kind of uber prefects here in this regard, we're, we're seeing a transition of temporal authority from actual embodied authority figures like Dumbledore and the other professors of Hogwarts to the student body. And that is a partial transition, an incomplete transition, but still a very strong transition. Tyler is joining us here for the first time, also late to the party, he says, but here for my very first live stream of anything produced by Point North. Tyler, it is good to have you here. Merging puppy observers, we started without her. How, how unjust of us, that is a terrible thing. Um, Rohit asks, what do you mean when you say that Goblet of Fire is kind of the height of boarding school adventure Harry Potter? Is isn't the height in the first two books? Um, in a sense, I mean, you're absolutely right. The first two books are the purest boarding school adventure because there's nothing pushing back against that. In the third book here, we're getting a tension between boarding school and, well, I, I guess there's nothing pushing back against that is overstating it. We talked through the, the discussion of the first two books about the ways in which the boarding school adventure is in tension with the fantasy story adventure of Harry Potter, and that's heightened in Prisoner of Azkaban. Now that we've inverted the power dynamic between the wizard world and the muggle world, now that we are open at least to external threats here at Hogwarts in a way that we never were, the threat in the first book, the threat in the second book, they are not just from within Hogwarts, but kind of fundamentally from within Hogwarts. They are archetypally from within Hogwarts, and they are threats which will certainly affect the outside world, but in effect, 
Hogwarts might as well be the whole wizarding world. That is not true in Prisoner of Azkaban. Instead, now we've got a tension between the school and the wider world. You know, we've got the Ministry and we've got the Dementors of Azkaban. We've got a sense of the wider world here and how it influences and is influenced by life at Hogwarts. By the time we get to Goblet of Fire and the introduction of the Triwizard Tournament, we're reframing life at Hogwarts. Now it is just a school, not the school. Now it is just a pocket sanctuary contained within the, the wider wizarding world. And then with the introduction of the Triwizard Tournament, we're also kind of doubling down on this idea that, that academic life should be adventurous in and of itself. So the tension within and without is absolutely purposeful in Goblet of Fire, and I think actually rather beautifully done. I think that a lot of people who have problems with the Triwizard Tournament aren't necessarily reading that book as Rowling intended it to be read, certainly there is contained within the text, as I will argue when we discuss Goblet of Fire, a real tension between uh, the Triwizard Tournament and the darkening of the world outside. We'll get to all of that in due course, of course. But then, too, in, in Order of the Phoenix, we've pretty much dispensed with the idea that Hogwarts is a sanctuary of any kind. Hogwarts is textually, explicitly, no longer a sanctuary. It is no longer preserved within the wizarding world. It is no longer kind of metonymically representative of the wizarding world. It is now just a place, a place that is crucially vulnerable. And that vulnerability of Hogwarts, I think, is profound. Because for all that we are facing real and urgent threats in the first two books, Hogwarts remains. Hogwarts is still Hogwarts. And now Hogwarts is still Hogwarts, but it is Hogwarts that has been bounded by Dementors, bounded by an evil that comes in from outside. That's going to be even more true in Goblet of Fire. And then, as I say, by the time we get to Order of Phoenix and the rest of the series, effectively, we're kind of done with the idea that Hogwarts is in any way structurally or thematically special. This is absolutely purposeful, I'm sure, and absolutely appropriate for Harry's adolescent journey for his his buildings roman coming of age tale you know as harry matures so school becomes less special he is opening up to the outside world and that starts here that starts now this is reflected of course in the presence of the dementors as i've said but it's also reflected as we'll discuss in tonight's reading with the existence the kind of developed existence of hogsmeade now the world is wider harry isn't restricted but also crucially isn't safe. Again, we see J.K. Rowling masterfully externalize Harry's adolescent experience into the world in general, the entire world of her fictional creation, the entire world of her secondary creation. I think it's really beautifully done. And a lot of that begins right now. Uh, Rob is saying Umbridge is literally more evil than the Dementors following this logic. Umbridge is literally more evil than anyone literally more evil than anyone. I would argue that Umbridge is literally more evil than Voldemort, and Voldemort is defined by the fact that he is evil. We'll talk about Dolores Umbridge and just how hateful she is when we get to Order of the Phoenix. Yeah. Okay, let's... Um, Umbridge is the absolute worst, says Jenna Katz, in all caps, so we know that she means it, and I am inclined to agree. Um, Yes, the Heroes and Bard says, who the hell thinks, hmm, Hogwarts is in danger, but let's not send the Aurors, but the scary depression monsters to hang out with the adolescents. Well, why are we doing that? Is it true that Rowling hasn't developed the Ministry yet? Well, no, I think that we actually get a pretty good perspective on the Ministry in this reading, in fact, as we move forward. We've already had a good perspective on the Ministry back in the, the latter half of Chamber of Secrets, which we're also going to reference in tonight's reading. Let's move on and get to all of that. There's a lot of talk about the other books going on, says Eric. I know, I know. But in part, that is because I want to highlight how purposeful and how special this transition is, how careful this transition is. The middle of Goblet of Fire is going to be an actually effective midpoint for the entire series, and that's that's impressive. But we are foreshadowing all of that here. And as someone who has constantly, I think, been critical of the emergent mythology of Harry Potter, constantly critical in particular of the idea that J.K. Rowling had every detail of every book worked out in advance, I think I should, you know, in... in in fairness and with due diligence, I think I should observe that actually what we're doing here is really smart and really careful and really purposeful and easy, I think, to overlook. Um, Josh asks, if Sirius can escape Azkaban, what is the point of Dementors at Hogwarts? Well, this is excellent. This is a very good point. Um, how did Sirius Black escape Azkaban? Why do we think that the Dementors would be any more capable of stopping him here than they would on their home turf? That, I think, is not the point. 
I mean, literally, it is the point, and it does leave some unanswered questions. But more thematically, well, the Dementors serve two purposes. They serve the primary plot of this book, or the primary theme, excuse me, of this book, which is not just fear, but the fear of fear. It really addresses, in a very sophisticated and mature way, the virtue that we have held our characters to since the very beginning of the series. Courage. Courage is the thing. Hufflepuffs are loyal and they are reliable and they are honest and they have three distinct characteristics. Gryffindors don't get three distinct characteristics. They get three versions of the same characteristic, which is courage. They are brave and they are steadfast and they are courageous and that is it. So by targeting courage as a core theme, we're applying some leverage here to Harry specifically, of course, he's our primary area of interest, but also Hermione, and also Ron, and also, goodness knows, Neville. We've got a lot to discuss on that topic as we move forward. Um, let's move on to our next slide, and we'll take a look here at some of the world building that we're getting from Hogwarts. And this is a really powerful passage in two distinct ways. See if you can spot them. See if you can call out why I think this passage is so very important. All around them, people were asking one another the same question. How did he get in? Maybe he knows how to apparate, said a Ravenclaw a few feet away. Just appear out of thin air, you know. Disguised himself, probably, said a Hufflepuff fifth year. He could have flown in, suggested Dean Thomas. Honestly, am I the only person who ever bothered to read Hogwarts a history? Said Hermione crossly to Harry and Ron. Probably, said Ron. Why? Because the castle's protected by more than walls, you know, said Hermione. There are all sorts of enchantments on it to stop people entering by stealth. You can't just apparate in here. And I'd like to see the disguise that could fool those Dementors. They're guarding every single entrance to the grounds. They'd have seen them fly in, too. And Filch knows all the secret passages. They'll have them covered. The lights are going out now, Percy shouted. I want everyone in their sleeping bags and no more talking. As Becca calls out, Hermione did her homework. I love my girl. We all love Hermione. As Aaron says, one day, <laughs> with initial caps, as though this was the title of Hermione's autobiography, one day you will read Hogwarts a history, and maybe that will remind you you can't apparate or disapparate within the grounds of Hogwarts. Yes. Nobody, has, as Fina says, nobody has read Hogwarts a history. Nobody except Hermione. It's pretty great. It's pretty great. And it does two very important things. Because as you'll see here, Hermione is not completely correct. There are all sorts of enchantments on it to stop people entering by stealth, she says. Great. You can't just apparate in here. Subpoint the first. You can't just apparate in here. Gosh, it's as though there were some kind of, I don't know, let's call it a jinx, preventing people from apparating or more purposefully disapparating on the grounds of Hogwarts. And she says, subpoint the second, I'd like to see the disguise that could fool those Dementors. In what way is that relevant to Hogwarts a history? There are all kinds of enchantments, she says, on the castle to stop people entering by stealth. You can't just apparate in here, and I'd like to see the disguise that could fool those Dementors. They're guarding every single entrance to the grounds. They'd have seen him fly, fly in too. Right, but the Dementors aren't a fixture of Hogwarts security. So the enchantments on the castle itself, on the grounds, the campus of Hogwarts itself, no matter how detailed they are in Hogwarts a history, are irrelevant. Even Hermione is turning to the Dementors and acknowledging thereby that this is a threat from outside. This is an explicitly, and for the first time in Harry Potter, adult threat that is coming in to Hogwarts. Because when I say adult too, I don't just mean mature. Obviously, Professor Quirrell was mature. He was technically an adult, but he was, by virtue of his position at Hogwarts, a part of the boarding school adventure. He was of the school. Sirius Black, crucially, is not of the school. The Dementors are not of the school. And Hermione is kind of, is taking ownership of the presence of the Dementors in order to reassure everyone that Hogwarts is safe, but the Dementors are not a part of this structure. So that is the first interesting thing that I call out here. The second is much more purposeful. The parallels here between Sirius Black and Harry Potter continue. This chapter is concerned about how Sirius Black manages to get into Hogwarts without being seen. The next chapter focuses on how Harry gets out of Hogwarts without being seen. We're lampshading the security of the castle right before we undermine it with the Marauder's Map. And the addition of more secret passages is a deft and powerful bit of narrative. And we anchor it in the ongoing and developing similarities between Harry and Sirius powerfully. Sirius was imprisoned 
in Azkaban. Harry was imprisoned at Privet Drive. Sirius escaped and was pursued by Dementors. Harry escaped and was pursued, I guess pursued in quotes, first by the night bus and then by Cornelius Fudge himself. One of these people is acting completely outside of the authority structures of the wizarding world and the other is operating completely within the authority structures of the wizarding world, but they are not different. And certainly that line that Hermione gets, Filch knows all the secret passages, they'll have them covered. We're going to explicitly call this out not 15 pages from now when Harry goes to Hogsmeade under the guidance of the Marauder's Map. Once again, we're connecting these two things together. Apparition was mentioned back in Chamber of Secrets. Apparition, a little trivia for you here. Apparition got mentioned twice within, you know, two lines back in Chamber of Secrets when Ron is justifying his decision to fly Arthur Weasley's Ford Anglia to Hogwarts. But this is the first time that we've had mention of the anti-apparition jinx, of the, of the prohibition about apparition in the grounds of Hogwarts. So we know that apparition exists and we know that it allows people to travel instantly from one place to another. But when Ron mentions it back in Chamber of Secrets, he doesn't say Say, oh damn, and we can't even apparate to Hogwarts, we have to take the car. He says, oh, but it's okay, my parents can apparate back home. Developing ideas here, developing ideas. Josh says, Hermione being an insufferable know-it-all who doesn't truly know it all, I love her character, but sometimes she's not always right as much as we may want her to be. Yes, yes, I, I love that observation. And of course, Hermione herself comes to that realization. Hermione's arc, much more subtle than Harry's and much more complex than Ron's, is I think the, the kind of secret weapon in the last act, really, you know, in, in the last two books, in the last three movies of Harry Potter, I think Hermione's transition is, is for me, completely compelling. I just love it. Uh, Nicole gives us an alternate title, I guess, for this book, but also ultimately for the entire series, Harry Potter and the Discovery that Authority Figures Don't Actually Know Everything. Well, this is, this is the threshold of adolescence, right? This is the moment at which we begin to become adults, is the, the moment when we realize that authority figures are not appointed divinely, you know? In the first two books, we are respectful even of Snape. We concede Snape's absolute authority in the first two books because he is a professor, even though he is apparently extremely evil, you guys. It doesn't matter because he's a professor and that is a position that we can't really touch. Even, you know, Professor Quirrell to a certain degree, Gilderoy Lockhart, absolutely. We, we understand that these characters are a part of the kind of legalistic framework of the world of Hogwarts and that is now all starting to crack and fall away. As Heroes and Bard says in the YouTube chat, I love that Hogwarts becomes progressively less safe as Harry grows up, which is of course a kind of appropriately fantastical realization of the fundamental truth that the world becomes less safe as we all grow up. That is what growing up means. You're no longer secluded. You're no longer protected. You're no longer safe. The world is wider and more wonderful and more dangerous than you initially thought. Let's go. Um, yeah, Rob says, I love how Hermione, oh, how Harry is defined of Snape almost right from the start, though. I think Hermione has the hardest time letting go. That is absolutely true. That's part of her whole realization. Harry is, by virtue of his exceptionalism, by dint of his effort, uh, he is kind of an outsider right from the beginning. We've already talked, gosh, many times about Harry's exceptionalism and how that works in the frame of the text. Hermione is also exceptional. God knows I want to take nothing away from young Hermione Granger, but she is more invested in the structures of school, more invested in the structures of her society. And she will, yeah, realize that those structures don't hold either. Yeah, good, okay. Let's keep moving on here to Harry and his first uh, first incident of eavesdropping in tonight's reading. Uh, <laughs> Harry heard the door of the hall creak open again and more footsteps. Headmaster. It was Snape. Harry kept quite still, listening hard. The whole of the third floor has been searched. He's not there. And Filch has done the dungeons. Nothing there either. What about the astronomy tower, Professor Trelawney's room, the Owlry? All searched. Very well, Severus. I didn't really expect Black to linger. Have you any thought as to how he got in, Professor? asked Snape. Harry raised his head very slightly off his arms to free his other ear. Many, Severus. Each of them as unlikely as the next. 
Harry opened his eyes a fraction and squinted up to where they stood. Dumbledore's back was to him, but he could see Percy's face wrapped with attention and Snape's profile, which looked angry. You remember the conversation we had, Headmaster, just before uh, the start of term, said Snape, who was barely opening his lips as though trying to block Percy out of the conversation. I do, Severus, said Dumbledore, and there was something like warning in his voice. It seems almost impossible that Black could have entered the school without inside help. I did express my concerns when you appointed. I do not believe a single person inside this castle would have helped Black enter it, said Dumbledore, and his tone made it so clear that the subject was closed that Snape didn't reply. I must go down to the Dementors, said Dumbledore. I said I would inform them when our search was complete. Firstly, informing the Dementors must be a pretty terrifying thing. I think going down and and addressing the uh, the Dementors directly, and this is not the first time that we get the idea of someone addressing the Dementors directly, and it won't be the last. This isn't even the only time in this reading that we get the idea of someone addressing the Dementors directly. That's pretty bad. It does open the possibility that we are that we are engaging with the Dementors throughout the course of the book through Harry's POV, which means that we are seeing them in a kind of active mode. And perhaps if the Dementors can simply be informed by Dumbledore that the castle has been searched, that Sirius Blank has not been found, and hey, maybe you should back off just a little bit, perhaps the Dementors are not as utterly merciless as we may believe them to be if we are reading the events of the story strictly from Harry's perspective. Brian asks a fascinating question. I wonder if Lily and James had had a daughter and if said daughter had resembled Lily, if Snape would have behaved differently toward her. Given the last interaction of Snape and Harry, uh, that may be entirely possible. Given the importance of uh, Harry's physical resemblance to his mother, perhaps, perhaps. That's not an undisturbing thought, I have to say, yes. Uh, Jamie asks, how does Harry not guess that Snape suspects Lupin? Isn't he the only new person who has been appointed? Well, no, but he is the only person that Harry would suspect, because if we remember, only two new professors were appointed this year, Professor Lupin and Professor Hagrid. Like, technically, Hagrid was appointed as a professor at the start of the term, so it is possible that we're supposed to be, I don't know, somehow skeptical of Hagrid, but there is nothing in the text that prompts us to be skeptical of Hagrid in any way. Instead, we have Lupin. Of course, we, the reader, perhaps more, uh, more uh, perceptive than Harry, perhaps more perspicacious than Harry, we now are at least suspicious of, of Lupin. And if we're not yet, we definitely will be in just a few pages time. Yeah, good. <laughs> yes, we're pointing out some of the problems here with the uh, with the logic here for uh, for Dumbledore. But yeah, only as Aaron says, only one person can be plotting anything in the castle at one time. Yes, we certainly have no plot overlap here. There's one story, one plot per year. That's how the series is structured. And it's probably for the best. Again, that is something that is going to absolutely fall away. And that is something that, that Rowling is deliberately invoking here. The idea that that there is only one plot going on because of course in Prisoner of Azkaban there I mean there's one plot but there isn't one single antagonist here we have well gosh depending on how you count it at least three at least three kind of antagonist level characters in in this story so we'll get to all of that as we move forward of course um good good as Zygmorphic says, Harry's not particularly clever with the figuring out of stuff. That's what Hermione is for. That is literally Zygmorphic's what Hermione is for. That is what the whole, you know, House Ravenclaw is for. Just, just figuring stuff out. Yes. Good. Um, let me see here as I, as I scroll back through the YouTube chat. Um, yeah, we're talking about the redemption of Snape. There will be there will be plenty of time to talk about uh, the the possible theoretical redemption of Snape, and even the the character of Severus Snape. We'll have plenty of time to talk about him in the future. So this is our conversation. This is the suggestion that someone from inside the school is helping Black. That this isn't just an intrusion from outside. And as I said earlier, you know, as we are recognizing that the intrusion of Black is an external threat upon the safety of childhood. You know, this isn't just Hogwarts. This is all of childhood. This is an assault on innocence itself. We should not be surprised, perhaps, given our history with Hogwarts, that there is another force active within the school that may be assisting him. And now we, at least, have a specific point of suspicion in that regard. Um, 
this conversation is very good. I, I love basically all the scenes that we get between Dumbledore and Snape for the entire book, uh, for the entire series, excuse me. Um, Rob says, do you think Snape has a bit of an inherent questioning of authority too, and that's why he acts as badly as he does, or does he really just want to pin Lupin that badly? Well, this is fascinating, right? Because, um, gosh, okay. You know what? L let's let's come back to Snape's role in the school vis-a-vis -vis Lupin in just a few slides time, because there are a couple of other things. There are a couple of other pieces of evidence I want to have at our fingertips before we get too deep into that discussion. Um, yes, good, good. Okay, let's uh, move on to our next slide here. And a quick detour here into our Quidditch plot for this book, such as it is. Flint's excuse is that their Seeker's arm's still injured, said Wood, grinding his teeth furiously. But it's obvious why they're doing it. Don't want to play in this weather. Think it'll damage their chances. There had been strong winds and heavy rain all day, and as Wood spoke, they heard a distant rumble of thunder. There's nothing wrong with Malfoy's arm, said Harry furiously. He's faking it. I know that, but we can't prove it, said Wood bitterly. And we've been practicing all these moves, assuming we're playing Slytherin, and instead it's Hufflepuff, and their style's quite different. They've got a new captain and Seeker, Cedric Diggory. Angelina, Alicia, and Katie suddenly giggled. What? said Wood, frowning at this light-hearted behavior. He's that tall, good-looking one, isn't he? said Angelina. Strong and silent, said Katie, and they started to giggle again. He's only silent because he's too thick to string two words together, said Fred impatiently. I don't know why you're worried, Oliver. Hufflepuff's a pushover. Last time we played them, Harry caught the snitch in about five minutes, remember? We'll play, we'll, excuse me, we were playing in different, excuse me, we were playing in completely different conditions. I get so excited when I'm reading Oliver Wood that sometimes I just get overtaken by it. We were playing in completely different conditions, Wood shouted, his eyes bulging slightly. Diggory's put a very strong side together. He's an excellent seeker. I was afraid you'd take it like this. We mustn't relax. We must keep our focus. Slytherin is trying to wrong foot us. We must win. Oliver, calm down, said Fred, looking slightly alarmed. We're taking off a puff very seriously. Seriously. Because, you know, Cedric sighs, says Angela, and Cedric is not thick, says Elizabeth. Well, that's fair. This is Fred, though, so who knows how much we can trust his judgment here. Uh, Brian says, in which sports do you get to reschedule your match because you have a player with an injury, especially when you have magic healing? And more crucially, Brian, in which sport do you have no reserves on your team whatsoever? A Quidditch team is seven people, and that is it. That is all it can ever be. We have no kind of alternate route here. This entire construction, in fairness, makes about as much sense as Quidditch makes on its best day. But we just have to kind of go along with it. There has been a substitution here, and I have no problem that uh, Malfoy is playing up the extent of his injury. The injury, of course, that he suffered at the, um, I was going to say hands of Buckbeak, but I don't think that's that's biologically or physiologically appropriate, uh, that he suffered <laughs> from Buckbeak. I have no doubt that he is playing it up and and uh, demanding proper, uh, proper alteration of planning and, and recompense here. I love, of course, Oliver Wood's enthusiasm. Oliver Wood is a very, gosh, it pains me to say it, Oliver Wood is a very thin character. He kind of has one trait, which is he cares more about Quidditch than anyone else in history ever, and exclamation points, you guys, exclamation points. The penultimate paragraph here, we were playing in completely different conditions, exclamation point. Wood shouted, his eyes bulging slightly. Diggory's put a very strong side together, exclamation point. He's an excellent seeker, exclamation point. I was afraid you'd take it like this, exclamation point, and so on, and so on, and so on. It's just fantastic. And of course, gets us where we need to be in terms of Harry's encounter with the Dementors during the Quidditch match. But uh, yes, also that Cedric Diggory sounds pretty cool. You guys hope we hear more of him in the future. Hope we get a lot of insight into his, uh, you know, long and happy life. Oh boy. Okay. Um, Josh says, yeah, but we all know someone like Oliver Wright, Point North. I wonder if Josh is making any kind of, of, of intimation there. I wonder if there's any kind of side eye there, Josh, about my level of enthusiasm about I don't know all things ever. Yeah. <laughs> As Jenna asks, in again, all caps, Jenna Katz deploying the all caps in the YouTube chat tonight like she has weaponized it. Who the hell is Cedric Diggory? Well, we'll get to that, you guys. We'll get to that. Zygmorphic says, now just think about the fact that Oliver and Percy share a dorm. Can you imagine the conversations? I would love to see, I would love to see Oliver Wood outside of this context. I would love to see him in a more kind of chill state. But yeah, unfortunately, we're, uh, we're pretty thin. Yeah, good. 
<laughs> Jenna says, I'm sorry, I have a lot of feelings, Alistair. Do not hate on my caps. I was doing the opposite of hating on your caps. I promise you. I am a huge fan of all caps for emphasis, and I'm very glad that you are calling this out. <laughs> and now it's spreading in the YouTube chat. This is the uh, this is the inevitable consequence of that. No, never fear your enthusiasm. Wield your enthusiasm. If Oliver Wood has taught us anything, exclamation point, it is that we should be enthusiastic, exclamation point, even if it is about Quidditch. So we're getting this development here. Now we're getting the, the push to the, the match against Hufflepuff. Let's see how that shakes out. But before we get to that, we need to have our Defense Against the Dark Arts class, from which Professor Lupin is mysteriously absent. But that's OK, because we've got everyone's favorite second choice for the Defense Against the Dark Arts class, Severus Snape. Which of you can tell me how we distinguish between the werewolf and the true wolf, said Snape. Everyone sat in motionless silence, everyone except Hermione, whose hand, as it so often did, had shot straight into the air. Anyone? Snape said, ignoring Hermione. His twisted smile was back. Are you telling me that Professor Lupin hasn't even taught you the basic distinction between... We told you, said Pavarti suddenly. We haven't got as far as werewolves yet. We're still in silence, snarled Snape. Well, well, well. I never thought I'd meet a third-year class who wouldn't even recognize a werewolf when they saw one. I shall make a point of informing Professor Dumbledore how very behind you all are. Please, sir, said Hermione, whose hand was still in the air. The werewolf differs from the true wolf in several small ways. The snout of the werewolf... That is the second time you have spoken out of turn, Miss Granger, said Snape coolly. Five more points from Gryffindor for being an insufferable know-it-all. Hermione went very red, put down her hand, and stared at the floor with her eyes full of tears. It was a mark of how much the class loathed Snape that they were all glaring at him, because every one of them had called Hermione a know-it-all at least once, and Ron, who told Hermione she was a know-it-all at least twice a week, said loudly, You asked us a question, and she knows the answer. Why ask if you don't want to be told? Yes, as Hannah points out, this scene might be the first in the book where the other Gryffindors besides our three heroes show courage and bravery explicitly, and it's against Slytherin Snape. This is perfect, yes. And Axis, too, is calling out the alliteration that we so often get with Snape. Silence snarled Snape, yes. We really like leaning on the, uh, the sibilance there. It's very strong. So what, <laughs> Saved Girl 309 says, can someone please explain foreshadowing? Yes, this is literally what Snape is doing. And now we have to question what Snape's plan is, what Snape's game is, and to whom Snape owes loyalty. Because this is basically our third beat with Snape and Lupin in the book to date. In the first beat, back with Harry's first conversation with Lupin, we see Snape bringing Lupin the mysterious potion. And while he is cool to Harry, he doesn't seem to be completely hostile to Lupin. Now, Sirius Black has all but outright attacked Hogwarts Castle, certainly infiltrated Hogwarts, and Snape is openly suspicious of Lupin, openly enough, at least, that he will take his concerns to Dumbledore. And that kind of introduces a retroactive zeroth encounter between uh, Snape and Lupin, where apparently, prior to the start of term, Snape had expressed some doubts and some concerns about the appointment of Professor Lupin as Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher. So now we have Snape Okay, and this is going to necessitate some spoilers, and I'm sorry, but if you're not already kind of here in terms of the book, then, you know, the, the book is kind of heavily foreshadowing this. So there is a connection between Professor Lupin and werewolves. There is a connection between Professor Lupin and lycanthropy. We're going to get there in a few chapters' time, but Snape is clearly anticipating this reveal. The purpose of this task seems to be explicitly to have this class realize the truth about Professor Lupin. Oh, how odd that Professor Lupin isn't here. Full moon again, is it? Okay, just checking that out. All right, by the way, let's talk about werewolves and how to identify them. And please go and write an excessive essay about how to do exactly that. Snape is not taking direct action against Lupin because, well, that would be wrong, or at least impractical. He's also kind of not taking action structurally, in terms of his authority within the school against Lupin, because he's already gone to Dumbledore, and Dumbledore has shut that down. He has closed that subject completely. 
So instead, he's now trying to manipulate the children, the Gryffindor children specifically, into recognizing what Lupin is. But he doesn't want to do it outright. He doesn't. For example, go to Draco Malfoy and say, BT dubs, Lupin's a werewolf. You should probably spread that news around school. You should probably spread that far and wide. In fact, no, here he wants something else. Presumably what he wants is to keep his hands clean. He's being manipulative here. So why is he being manipulative about taking Lupin down? Is it just that he wants this prestigious defense against the dark arts post? Is it that he wants to teach this class so much more than he wants to teach potions? Well, possibly, but then that doesn't really explain the earlier scene where we see not, as I say, a camaraderie or any kind of affection shared between Snape and Lupin, but at least a certain civility, at least a certain kind of professional respect and professional regard. It does seem to be the case that it is the attack by Severus, uh, by, by Severus Snape, excuse me, the attack by Sirius Black on Hogwarts itself that has kind of forced Snape to take action, an unconventional action, but action nonetheless. Um, Yes, as Angela says, what? Remus Lupin is connected to werewolves? I mean, it's in his name. It's almost destined that he become a werewolf. Yes, Remus Lupin is pretty much all you need in order to go, hey, dude's probably a werewolf. This is why I don't feel bad spoiling this turn, you guys. As I say, normally I want to respect the kind of arc of the story, but this is so important, and I genuinely think that the book has by this point, particularly as we introduce werewolves here as a major theme or as a major, a major topic of discussion, this is the point at which we should be, you know, jumping to the appropriate conclusion and kind of leaning on this dramatic irony between the audience and Harry as we move forward. Yeah, good. Um, let me see. As I'm moving back through the YouTube chat, I think we're all caught up. Um, yes, why not just point a sign that says werewolf every time they're in the same room, <laughs> says Rob. Yeah, there, there are other ways that we could do this. The only explanation for Snape's action here for me is that he wants to keep his hands clean. He doesn't care if someone else comes forward, but if Malfoy comes forward and says, oh, Professor Lupin's a werewolf, then that is going to be traced immediately back to Snape. But if one of the Gryffindors comes forward, then perhaps not. Um, yes, and, and Zygmorphix asks, is there a chance that Snape is justifying this as warning Harry about someone he sees as dangerous? Possibly, right? This is the kind of most subtle and perhaps arguably least likely. Um, at least at this point in the narrative, I would buy Snape's loyalty to Hogwarts first, Dumbledore second, Harry Potter a very distant third. But certainly one possible interpretation of the scene is, well, he doesn't tell Malfoy because Malfoy doesn't need to know. He tells these kids because these kids, specifically Harry, arguably Hermione and Ron too, need to know about werewolves because something very direct may happen in the future. So they, they may need that specific knowledge pretty, pretty soon. Hero of Time asks, what's the line drawn between Snape's adolescent immaturity and the hard-edged bitterness and cynicism of adulthood? Is he truly concerned about betrayal or is this just petty juvenile nonsense? This is the question. We will find out that one of the reasons that Lupin took the post at Hogwarts in the first place is because of the presence of Severus Snape and his capability with the Wolfsbane potion, which suppresses Professor Lupin's, you know, lycanthropic tendencies, I suppose. Um, so presumably, in order for that to be part of his contract, I guess, there must be some kind of, of amiability between Snape and Lupin which would suggest that that has now been completely discarded, that that has been shaped or, or changed by the intrusion of Sirius Black into Hogwarts. Again, Severus Snape remains superficially outright villainous, but upon closer examination, a more complex character than we may expect. Again, I don't know how much of Snape's character J.K. Rowling had in mind. I don't know how many of the final reveals were already embedded at this point, but they are here, I think, if we read the text very carefully. Um, yeah, good, good. Uh, Casey says, um, yes, Valerie asks, I wonder if Lupin would actually teach the chapter or skip it. Perhaps he should have taught it first. What do we make of Lupin that he hasn't taught werewolves? Presumably, the children are right in that they simply haven't got to werewolves yet. But I suppose we might ask the question, why would Lupin not lead off with that? He's obviously suspicious of his own nature. He wants to protect his position. Certainly, there is a real stigma associated with lycanthropy, and there are obviously real-world associations with lycanthropy in, in Harry Potter. So, you know, there's some thematic stuff going on there, but he wants to keep it secret. Is he 
it's compromising the education of his students, even as he seems to be excelling as a, as a professor of the defense against the dark arts, is he compromising the safety and security of his students in order to protect his secret? Possibly. Possibly. We may be casting shadows of more than one variety on Remus Lupin at this point. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, wrap up this chapter then with Harry's encounter with the Dementors during the Quidditch match. Come on, he growled at his nimbus as the rain whipped his face. Faster! But something odd was happening. An eerie silence was falling across the stadium. The wind, though as strong as ever, was forgetting to roar. It was as though someone had turned off the sound, as though Harry had gone suddenly deaf. What was going on? And then a horribly familiar wave of cold swept over him, inside him, just as he became, of some, just as he became aware of something moving on the field below. Before he had time to think, Harry had taken his eyes off the snitch and looked down. At least a hundred Dementors, their hidden faces pointing up at him, were standing beneath him. It was as though freezing water were rising in his chest, cutting at his insides, and then he heard it again. Someone was screaming, screaming inside his head. A woman, not Harry, not Harry, please not Harry. Stand aside, you silly girl. Stand aside now. Not Harry, please, no. Take me, kill me instead. Numbing, swirling white mist was filling Harry's brain. What was he doing? Why was he flying? He needed to help her. She was going to die. She was going to be murdered. He was falling, falling through the icy mist. Not Harry, please have mercy, have mercy. A shrill voice was laughing. The woman was screaming, and Harry knew no more. The depression of the Dementors once more afflicting Harry here. Rob is ducking out. Uh, he's just started working again this week. I've been slowly passing out this entire time. See everyone next week. Rob, have a good night. Thank you for joining us here. Um, Yes, this is a very beautifully composed passage, a very deep passage, you know, in terms of its significance for the entire mythology of Harry Potter, but also just a beautifully written passage. Um, who was it here? Someone just called it out. Oh, Rohit called out in the YouTube chat, forgetting to roar. My God, that's great. It absolutely is. An eerie silence was falling across the stadium. The wind, as strong as ever, was forgetting to roar. It was as though someone had turned off the sound, as though Harry had gone suddenly deaf. What was going on? And then a horribly familiar wave of cold. And again, we see this mastery of pace that we've discussed before in this book from J.K. Rowling here in the bottom half of this slide. And then he heard it again, ellipsis. Someone was screaming, screaming inside his head, ellipsis. A woman, ellipsis. We get the attributed dialogue, two more ellipses in the next line of attributed dialogue, a hard M dash cut there. The way that she controls the pace through the use of ellipses and M dash cuts is beautiful. And then also the ambiguity, the retreat of Harry from this situation, even as we are embedded deeper and deeper in his POV. And this happens right from the jump here. Come on, he growled at his nemesis, the rain whipped his face faster. We're in Harry's POV. We're feeling the urgency of this. He's, he's here in the midst of the Quidditch match. He's going against the snitch. This is going to happen. He's going to do that thing that he does. And then it starts to fracture. It starts to break. It was as though someone had turned off the sound as though Harry had gone suddenly deaf. M dash. What was going on? Question mark. Rhetorical question here, but it's a rhetorical question in Harry's voice. We are this close to him now that we're getting his internal monologue, which is very rare in the pages of Harry Potter. And then the horribly familiar wave of cold. Before he had time to think, Harry had taken his eyes off the snitch and looked down. A hundred dementors, their hidden faces pointing up at him, were standing beneath him. And let me tell you, as much as I love the Nazgulian depiction of the, the Dementors in the movies, this vision is so much worse. A hundred Dementors standing, not flying, not swirling, not supernatural beneath him, just standing, look at up at, looking up at him, watching him. That, to me, is way creepier than the flying, as I say, Nazgulian Dementors that we get in the movies. And then we get the, the breakthrough here. A hundred Dementors, their faces pointing up at him, were standing beneath him. It was as though freezing water was rising in his chest, cutting at his insides. Then he heard it again, ellipsis. Someone was screaming, screaming inside his head, ellipsis. A woman, ellipsis. Then attributed dialogue. We are now so deep in Harry's experience that we're getting his vision. We're getting his... his whatever this is, this, this Dementor-inspired memory of the past. Not Harry, not Harry, please, not Harry. Stand aside, you silly girl, stand aside now. This is 
Harry's experience engulfing us as it is engulfing him. Numbing, swirling white mist was filling Harry's brain. What was he doing? Why was he flying? Again, these rhetorical questions that he is asking himself. What's happening? What is going on here? Then he was falling, falling through icy mist. Not he lost grip on his broom or he, you know, tumbled down toward the Quidditch pitch. None of that matters. He's falling, falling through icy mist. We've got this disassociated experience here, this kind of sensory response. A shrill voice was laughing, the woman was screaming, and Harry knew no more. I love that. I just love it. Uh, Elizabeth is saying, I actually quite liked the movie Dementors. Um, oh, we're picking up on a couple of conversations here. The flying Dementors of the movie, says Rahit, always seemed off. It's visually appearing, sure, but a slow, creeping figure staring ominously is fundamentally scarier than something that just rushes at you. Yes, and a few people are calling out here, too, that, uh, that chocolate is now required. Yes. <laughs> I completely agree. I should have had chocolate with me for, for tonight's reading. Yes. Uh, Josh asks, another challenging thing about all this is how does one communicate with the Dementor? There are constant references to Dumbledore and or others, Fudge, talking to Dementors and them back. As I say, we are so embedded in Harry's response to the Dementors that we really don't understand how they function. We know that they are fearsome. We know that they are dangerous. We know that they are not entirely trusted. The ministry employs them pretty much, it would seem. Okay, let me revise that. The ministry, of course, employs them at Azkaban all the time. But the ministry employs them here in, in the rest of the wizarding world, apparently as a last resort against the most infamous mass murderer in, in wizarding history. And yet, we seem to be able to talk to them. We seem to be able to reason with them. As I said, when Dumbledore goes to say, well, we've searched the school and haven't found Sirius Black, the Dementors seem satisfied with that. They back off. So they are apparently sentient to the point of rationality. They can at least understand the process of searching for Sirius Black. But here, a hundred of them, two, a hundred of them gathered below Harry. It's pretty terrifying. Yeah. Um, good. Good. It's very visceral. All there was was screaming and cold, it says Heroes and Bards. Absolutely. Right. Right. Good. And, and Nikki says, well, Voldemort, well, okay, again, we know what this scene is, obviously. I mean, if you've read even the first book, then you have a pretty strong sense of what it is that Harry is remembering here. But uh, why Voldemort didn't simply kill Lily right away never made sense to me, even after hearing why. I'm kind of in the same place, though I do like the why. We'll talk about that when we get to it. Yeah. Good. Good. All right. Um... Yes, as Gildart's Winter says, the whole scene reminds me of It Follows, a villain, a killer who walks after you no matter where you go. Right. And it reminds me too, of course, of uh, the modern urban myth, the, the, the internet myth of the Slender Man. There is something there about this, this single figure who just watches, a faceless single figure who just watches. And there is a kind of compelling line of, of argument that the development of the Slender Man as a modern artifact of, of internet culture was kind of influenced by the presence of Dementors. Yeah, that, that seems interesting. Good. And water symbolism with the rain, Hannah says. Does water equal evil? Um, yeah, we don't normally associate the rain with evil, but certainly, yes, with... with um, it is almost, to me, more suggestive of... Uh, not Not that water equals evil connection that we discussed a little bit last time as we were talking about the kind of elemental connections with, with the houses of Hogwarts. But there is certainly the, the notion here of nature kind of untamed and wild, nature in its most antagonistic and destructive element, you know? That seems to me to be somewhat associated with the presence of the Dementors too. And of course, we have the grinding, crushing cold of the Dementors. That's a consistent feature of their appearance, yeah. Good. Good. It was a dark and stormy night, says Brian. <laughs> oh, and Merging Puppy is noping right out of the discussion of Slenderman, which I can completely understand. I've written quite a lot about the Slenderman, and yeah, pretty creepy, you guys. Pretty creepy. Okay, that is going to do it for uh, Chapter 9. Let's move into Chapter 10, The Marauder's Map, with a conversation with Lupin about Dementors. We should frame this a little bit, too, by saying that this is the Defense Against the Dark Arts class where Lupin returns and throws out the idea of Snape's homework. No, actually, you don't have to do the two scrolls of parchment essay on werewolves that Snape set for you. Uh, probably don't even think about werewolves. Probably, you know, just, just tear that chapter out, out of your books. Probably just tear that chapter out and throw it away. Eat it, maybe it's fine. And then, of course, we get the lovely little comedic meat that... Uh, that uh, Hermione has already done the, um, <laughs> the essay there. So Harry talks with Lupin. 
Did you hear about the Dementors too? Said Harry with difficulty. Lupin looked at him quickly. Yes, I did. I don't think any of us have seen Professor Dumbledore that angry. They've been growing restless for some time, furious at his refusal to let them inside the grounds. I suppose they were the reason you fell. Yes, said Harry. He hesitated, and then the question he had to ask just burst from him before he could stop himself. Why? Why do they affect me like that? Am I just... It has nothing to do with weakness, said Professor Lupin sharply, as though he, has read Harry, as though he had read Harry's mind. The Dementors affect you worse than the others because there are horrors in your past that the others don't have. A ray of wintry sunlight fell across the classroom, illuminating Lupin's gray hairs and the lions on his young face. Dementors are among the foulest creatures that walk this earth. They infest the darkest, filthiest places. They glory in decay and despair. They drain peace, hope, and happiness out of the air around them. Even muggles feel their presence, though they can't see them. Get too near a Dementor, and every good feeling, every happy memory, will be sucked out of you. If it can, the Dementor will feed on you long enough to reduce you to something like itself, soulless and evil. You will be left with nothing but the worst experiences of your life. And the worst that happened to you, Harry, is enough to make anyone fall off their broom. You have nothing to feel ashamed of. I love Lupin here. This is, as Jenna asks, does anyone else cry whenever Lupin moves to be affectionate with Harry? Yes. I just adore, adore this sequence. And more importantly here, we get a perspective on what the Dementors do. If it can, the Dementor will feed on you long enough to reduce you to something like itself, soulless and evil. Okay, this is how they replicate. This is how they procreate. This is how they reproduce themselves. And we certainly get, Dementors are among the foulest creatures that walk this earth. They walk the earth. They are natural creatures. They're not created. This is one of the points of distinction between the Dementors and Tolkien's Nazgul, which were created by the application of the Nine Rings of Men upon people who should have known better. They're not created by wizards. They're not created by the Ministry for the Defense of Azkaban. They are natural creatures, and this is apparently how they reproduce. But let's look at that process a little bit. Get too near a Dementor, and every good feeling, every happy memory will be sucked out of you. If it can, the Dementor will feed on you long enough to reduce you to something like itself, soulless and evil. So you become soulless and evil when you lose every good feeling, every happy memory. They drain peace, hope, and happiness out of the air around them. And this is the most emphatic that J.K. Rowling has been to date. She will be more emphatic than this. She will be more emphatic than this in next week's reading, in fact. And certainly the presence of Patronuses through the rest of the series will kind of really cue us in to, or, or, or cue us to understand her kind of primary thematic conflict here. But this is the most emphatic that she has been so far about the connection between hope and peace and goodness. This is what distinguishes the good from the bad. And it's while I'm reading this passage, it's while I'm reading this book, that I'm reminded of our introduction to Professor Dumbledore and Professor McGonagall all the way back right at the beginning of Philosopher's Stone. When McGonagall says that there is a connection, there is a similarity, that there is a, a comparable level of power between Dumbledore and Voldemort. The difference is Voldemort will do things that Dumbledore will not do. More and more significant as we move through the arc of this entire series, because peace and hope and happiness are the ultimate opposition to evil itself, right? It's not that you will become bad. It's not that you will become miserable. It's not that you will become like the Dementors. I mean, you will become like the Dementors, but, but you will become specifically soulless and evil. And if we assume that Lupin is not being subject to this moment to, to you know, the whims of hyperbole and that he is actually attempting at least to kind of categorize the truth, then we see the opposition of the Dementors to all that is good in Harry Potter. And you'll notice here too, they infest the darkest, filthiest places, the glory and decay and despair. They drain peace, hope, and happiness out of the air around them. Even muggles can feel their presence so they can't see them. Of course, tying back there to the notion of the Dementors as depression, which has been you know, highlighted before. This is... Th there is no connection here, fundamentally, between the Dementors and fear. That is to say that 
fear itself does not seem to be a tool of the Dementors, unless it's fear in the sense that, that, that you are bereft of hope, possibly. But that doesn't seem to be the kind of fear that Harry is experiencing or that anyone else is experiencing upon exposure to the Dementors either. Um, Yes, Courtney is saying, as a counselor, I don't know if I agree with the idea that lack of happiness leads to evil depression. Yes, but evil? Well, this, I think, is is one of the ways in which we're kind of simplifying the thematic framework here at the heart of Harry Potter. I, I completely agree that certainly, okay, let us absolutely break the association between depression in the real world and dementors in the world of Harry Potter. I know that those two things are connected. I know that J.K. Rowling was inspired to create Dementors because of her experiences of depression and mental illness, but that does not mean that they, they are a direct substitution, the one for the other. It does not mean that Dementors are depression. It just means that they were inspired by that experience. And certainly the consequence of their, their presence seems to be something like depression. You know, that that's similar. But it does seem to be more than that. So... I, I agree. A, a superficial reading, and particularly the kind of you know um, first bullet point reading that, as you know, Dementors were inspired by J.K. Rowling's experiences of depression, that does lead to some unfortunate associations here that I think we should try to break. But more than more than depression, it seems as though what as uh, as Lupin says, if a can the Dementor will feed on you long enough to reduce you to something like itself, soulless and evil, you will be left with nothing but the worst experiences of your life. You'll be left with nothing but the worst experiences of your life. And in the absence of good, in the absence of hope, in the absence of illumination, you will be soulless and evil. That is, I mean, in terms of real world psychology, a really super problematic statement, right? <laughs> that is that is not the kind of thing that we want to bring back with us from Hogwarts into the real world. But as a thematic statement about how morality works within the frame of Harry Potter, I find it interesting. I find it most interesting because no one talks about courage. The other thing that no one talks about is Ginny Weasley. Um, you'll remember that we called out back on the Hogwarts Express that Ginny had the second most powerful response to uh, to the Dementors because of everything that she went through at the end of the uh, the end of the last school year, and yeah, she's still still pushing there too. Um, let me see here. Fear leads to hate. Hate leads to the dark side, says Angela. <laughs> Yeah, Aaron also calls out, uh, let me see, maybe there are multiple floors in Azkaban and petty crimes are kept at the bottom, but high security are kept at the top where the Dementors also are. I don't think petty criminals would get sent to Azkaban, though. I also wonder how many serious criminals are there in the wizarding world. I mean, Sirius Black is notable almost to the point of exclusivity. When we're talking about the escape of Sirius Black from Azkaban, at least here, obviously there's going to be another prison break a little later, and there will be some other characters who are introduced, but I wonder how many there are, and do we need a hundred Dementors? More than a hundred Dementors? Because presumably, a bunch of Dementors are still at Azkaban, you know, guarding the rest of the inmates. Um, do we have a sense that, that, that Azkaban is vast, or is it much smaller than that? How large would it need to be to imprison the most dangerous criminals of the wizarding world? How large would it need to be to imprison all criminals of the wizarding world? I just don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Right. Josh says Azkaban is, it, it is referred to as a high security prison, but since there is no other prison referenced in Harry Potter, we just have no sense of, of how, um, of how the kind of legalistic structure of the wizarding world works. Yeah. Okay. Gosh, we must keep pushing on. Let's see what we can do here. Uh, because it turns out that Fred and George have a little gift to offer Harry. Since he can't go off to, uh, to Hogsmeade, Fred and George have a little gift. Uh, Brian says, having just binged on all of Dear Mr. Potter, I can confidently state that the only phrase Point North utters more often than I genuinely don't know is, I'm kind of Team Jenny. I'm more than kind of Team Jenny, you guys. I'm absolutely Team Jenny. Team Jenny is the place to be. Jenny is fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Janet Katz says, please, God, comic relief, as we move on to Fred and George. Psst, Harry. He turned halfway along the third floor corridor to see Fred and George peering out at him from behind a statue of a humpbacked, one-eyed witch. What are you doing? said Harry curiously. How come you're not going to Hogsmeade? We've come to give you a bit of festive cheer before we go, said Fred with a mysterious wink. Come in here. He nodded toward an empty classroom to the left of the one-eyed statue. Harry followed Fred and George inside. George closed the door quietly and then turned, beaming, to look at Harry. Early Christmas present for you, Harry, 
he said. Fred pulled something from inside his cloak with a flourish and laid it on one of the desks. It was a large, square, very worn piece of parchment with nothing written on it. Harry, suspecting one of Fred and George's jokes, stared at it. What's this supposed to be? This, Harry, is the secret of our success, said George, patting the parchment fondly. So, the introduction of the Marauders map. In fact, let's just move straight on to the next slide. I, I wanted to highlight this slide because I wanted to talk a little about Fred and George's motivation here for giving Harry the Marauders map. I like the explanation. There is certainly a read of this that um, that that Fred and George are here engaged in archetypal trickster behavior, that this is a Loki-ish bid to sow chaos, that they are empowering a force for change and an, uh, an anti-authoritarian force within the bounds of Hogwarts. And, and yeah, okay, okay, yes. Honestly, you can make that argument if you like. If you see Fred and George as Loki-like puckish figures who just want to, to sow anarchy here in Hogwarts, that's fine. I mean, that's fine. And certainly I think that the movies go a certain distance toward exaggerating those elements of Fred and George's character. I very much like the reading here that Fred and George simply feel bad for Harry. And they, unlike anyone else in the school, unlike anyone who is more bound by rules, is more bound by convention here at Hogwarts, they can actually help Harry. They can actually bring him in on their little uh, on their little misadventures here. And they do so, of course, with the aid of the Marauder's Map. He took out his wand, touched the parchment lightly, and said, I solemnly swear I'm up to no good. And at once, thin ink lines began to spread like a spider's web from, that point, from the point that George's wand had touched. They joined each other. They crisscrossed. They fanned into every corner of the parchment. Then words began to blossom across the top, great curly green words that proclaimed... Mrs. Mooney, Wormtail, Patfoot, and Prongs, purveyors of aids to, to magical mischief makers, are proud to present the Marauder's Map. It was a map showing every detail of the Hogwarts castle and grounds, but the truly remarkable thing were the tiny ink dots moving around it, each labeled with a name in minuscule writing. Astounded, Harry bent over it. A labeled dot in the top left corner showed that Professor Dumbledore was pacing his study. The caretaker's cat, Mrs. Norris, was prowling the second floor, and Peeves the poltergeist was currently bouncing around the trophy room. And as Harry's eyes traveled up and down the familiar corridors, he noticed something else. This map showed a set of passages he had never entered, and many of them seemed to lead right into Hogsmeade, said Fred, tracing one of them with his finger. I said right at the beginning here that, uh, that um, this was my favorite magical artifact that J.K. Rowling ever created. I love the Marauder's Map with my whole heart. I am very glad that as I am recording this live session, I have a copy of the Marauder's Map on the shelf behind me, courtesy of the wonderful Elizabeth Stevens. That is one of her most treasured possessions. I'm not even kidding. And here it is in all of its resplendent glory. If you've never seen a copy of the, the Marauder's Map in real life, definitely go and get one, go look it up. It is absolutely enchanting and of course enchanted. The claim that the map shows every corner of Hogwarts is unlikely. We know pretty confidently, and this will be confirmed for us much later in the series, but we can be pretty sure even at this point that it does not show, for example, the Chamber of Secrets. We know that because Fred and George were looking for Ginny at the end of last term, presumably when they already had the Marauder's Map in their possession, and did not find her. Thus, we know that the Marauder's Map does not show the Chamber of Secrets. Uh, Secrets Does the Marauder's Map show the Room of Requirement? Uh, possibly not. Probably not, in fact. The Marauder's Map does have a powerful ability to discern the identity of things, not just people, which, let's face it, is impressive enough, but it names Mrs. Norris and Peeves the Poltergeist. So every resident, every quasi-sentient resident of Hogwarts Castle is here on the map. This, by the way, is another suggestion that the Hogwarts Castle is not terribly well populated, that perhaps there aren't a thousand kids running around Hogwarts at any time. But this is just, you know, it's fine. We can just move past that. Oh, um... Jamie says, I have a Marauder's Map magic mug and I love it. Jamie, was it you who posted that to Twitter earlier today? I have never seen the Marauder's Map magic mug and I adore that thing. It is the greatest. Yes, I desperately, desperately need to get one of those for uh, the rest of Dear Mr. Potter. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this, of course, is going to be absolutely necessary 
later. And of course, we can say that that the reason that the Marauders map doesn't show things like the Chamber of Secrets is that the Chamber of Secrets was never plotted. And there is some question about Hogwarts being unplottable. That is, that it, it is theoretically impossible to make a map of Hogwarts, presumably unless you're just there, unless you just explore the castle and make your map yourself. It wasn't you on Twitter, says Jamie, but yes, you absolutely need one. I'm stunned by that. Uh, what a coincidence that that should pop up today on, on my Twitter feed. That's wonderful. Um, <laughs> Um, oh, uh, Elizabeth is asking, what does Messrs stand for? Uh, it is uh, used as a formal title for more than one man, generally in the name of, of companies. It is an abbreviation. It's a not even really an abbreviation. It is an anglicization of uh, Messrieur, the plural of Monsieur in French. So it, it is a, a uh, plural uh, formal pronoun for man of a certain rank. Here it is obviously being used ironically, particularly when we find out the identity of the four people who created this map. Yeah, yes, as, as Nicole says, I think it's another way of saying misters, basically another say uh, another way of saying misters, yes, but taken from the uh, taken from the French. Yes. Um, so here it is. Here is our introduction to the Marauders map. This map is going to be enormously significant for the rest of the series, so I don't want to spend too much time talking about it right now, particularly when we have a lot of backstory to cover, and good lord, uh, hardly any time left to do it. Okay. <laughs> we will perhaps inappropriately put a pin in the Marauders map and come back to that in due course because we have to get to Hogsmeade. Harry follows the map, escapes the castle, goes to Hogsmeade, um, and then, you know, has a moment of realization, oh, wait, there is a secret passage now leading into Hogwarts that no one knows about. Huh, what if Sirius Black knows about it? We're immediately tying these two sides of the plot together, but we're also, again, drawing this reflective symmetry between Harry and Sirius Black himself. Harry hesitated. What if Black did know the passage was there? Ron, however, cleared his throat significantly and pointed to a notice pasted on the inside of the sweet shop door. By order of the Ministry of Magic, customers are reminded that until further notice, Dementors will be patrolling the streets of Hogsmeade every night after sundown. This measure has been put in place for the safety of Hogsmeade residents and will be lifted upon the recapture of Sirius Black. It is therefore advisable that you complete your shopping well before nightfall. Merry Christmas. See? said Ron quietly. I'd like to see Black try and break into Honeydukes with Dementors swarming all over the village. Anyway, Hermione, the Honeydukes owners would hear a break-in, wouldn't they? They live over the shop. So it's probably fine. It's probably fine. We'll come back to that. But first, we have to... Um, okay, we're going to move into um, the eavesdropping scene at the Three Broomsticks. This is basically going to take up the rest of our session tonight, and I'm going to have to move it a clip to get through it, let me tell you. Uh, but before we get to this scene, I want to talk a little about the scene in general. We're going to break down the backstory. We're going to break down the exposition. We're going to get into the history of Sirius Black and James Potter and their time at Hogwarts and their time after Hogwarts and, and everything that has happened. But I want to frame the scene a little bit first because... Boy, howdy, this is a weird scene. This is a really strange and atypical scene for J.K. Rowling. It is not atypical to have Harry eavesdrop on conversations that actually have, I was going to say nothing to do with him, but almost always have quite a lot to do with him. This would be the, I want to say, third time that he's done it in this book. He already eavesdropped on Arthur and Molly Weasley. He eavesdropped at the beginning of tonight's reading on Snape and Dumbledore, and now he's going to eavesdrop on this entire weird gaggle of people at the Three Broomsticks. Um, so it's not that Harry is listening in on a conversation that gives him vital plot information. That's been a feature of Harry Potter right from the beginning of the first book. This is different, though, because we've never had this kind of heavy-handed exposition. We've never had this kind of, and then what happened? And what about this? And who was that again? Could you please explain this character? This is tough from the perspective of, of, you know, someone who is very sensitive to reading exposition. That is not to say that the exposition that we get is bad. I love the backstory that we get here. I think it's brilliant. And I think that the, the detail that J.K. Rowling goes into here is extremely good indeed. It's just really clumsy in the way that it is, the way that it is delivered to the reader. And God knows, you know, I have my problems with the movie adaptations of many of these books all of these books, even Prisoner of Azkaban, which I think is the best movie. I love what the movie does with this scene. Having Harry be much more intrusive here and not just having these people talk about it in the open here in The Three Broomsticks, that is a smart choice. So we are going to talk about the, the gathering here of, of Madame Rosmerta and of uh, Fudge and of Hagrid and of both 
Flitwick and McGonagall. And one of the obvious kind of oppositions to this is, well, what the heck? It has been about six months, okay, charitably eight months, since Cornelius Fudge imprisoned Hagrid in Azkaban because he was suspected of having something to do with the Chamber of Secrets. <laughs> And Hagrid doesn't seem to hold a grudge. And that is appropriate, I think, because I want to show you the actual passage from Chamber of Secrets. Hagrid had gone pale and sweaty. He dropped into one of his chairs and looked from Dumbledore to Cornelius Fudge. Bad business, Hagrid, said Fudge in rather clipped tones. Very bad business. Had to come. Four attacks on Muggleborns. Things have gone far enough. Ministry's got to act. I never, said Hagrid, looking imploringly at Dumbledore. You know I never, Professor Dumbledore, sir. I want it understood, excuse me, I want it understood, Cornelius, that Hagrid has my full confidence, said Dumbledore, frowning at Fudge. Look, Albus, said Fudge uncom uncomfortably, Hagrid's record's against him. Ministry's got to do something. The school governors have been in touch. Yet again, Cornelius, I tell you that taking Hagrid away will not help in the slightest, said Dumbledore. His blue eyes were full of fire, full of a fire that Harry had never seen before. Look at it from my point of view, said Fudge, fidgeting with his bowler. I'm under a lot of pressure, got to be seen to be doing something. If it turns out it wasn't Hagrid, he'll be back and no more said. But I've got to take him, got to, wouldn't be doing my duty. Take me, said Hagrid, who was trembling. Take me where? For a short stretch only, said Fudge, not meeting Hagrid's eyes. Not a punishment, Hagrid, more a precaution. If someone else is caught, he'll be let out with a full apology. Not Azkaban, croaked Hagrid. Before Fudge could answer, there was another loud rap on the door. And for those of you who have forgotten, that rap on the door is from Lucius Malfoy, who is representing here the aforementioned school governors. Now, it is fair to say, I think, that J.K. Rowling has a weak hold on Cornelius Fudge as a character. He seems to be a pretty different guy in Chamber of Secrets than he is in The Prisoner of Azkaban, than he will be in later books in the series. Not terribly important, not, not terribly significant, at least. But within that passage, at least, we can see that Hagrid, while afraid, does seem to understand. He doesn't ever actually oppose Cornelius Fudge. Dumbledore does, and certainly there's an ongoing antipathy now between Dumbledore and, and Cornelius Fudge for that reason and many others. But Hagrid seems to understand, at least. So... I'm not completely surprised at Hagrid's presence here in this scene and he's, his seemingly avuncular relationship, or at least not openly hostile relationship with Fudge. But I do, you know, it, it is odd unless you're coming into this from a very recent reading. Yeah. Um, she really did, says Gildarth Winters. Fudge, Fudge. There it is. Thank you, Gildarth. That's very good. Yes. <laughs> Yes, and Nikki says, see, here we go. Hagrid's going to Azkaban for no reason. He's a scapegoat. The criminal system is effed. Uh, yeah, going to Azkaban, well, again, because he has a reputation, right? Because he has an involvement with the Chamber of Secrets. Kind of, not really, but okay, yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's clearly unjust. But even then, I think, God, I wish we'd had some reference to that. I wish we'd had some, some reference to Hagrid's time at Azkaban in this scene. Rather than kind of uh, avoiding it, rather than giving it the swerve here, I wish that we pointed it out because it would have gone a long way toward shadowing again this question of the legalistic systems, the legalistic frameworks that underpin wizarding society. That would have been a really strong opportunity, but instead we get this slightly weird beat. Yeah. It's, it feels too much to me as though we simply have Hagrid in this scene to be emotionally moved, but we'll get to all of that. So, we're eavesdropping. Do you think Black's still in the area, Minister? Whispered Madame Rosmarta. I'm sure of it, said Fudge shortly. You know that the Dementors have searched the whole village twice, said Madame Rosmarta, a slight edge to her voice, scared all my customers away. It's very bad for business, Minister. Rosmerta, my dear, I don't like them any more than you, uh, any more than you do, excuse me, said Fudge uncomfortably. Necessary precaution, unfortunate, but there you are. I just met some of them. They're in a fury against Dumbledore. He won't let them inside the castle grounds. I should think not, said Professor McGonagall sharply. How are we supposed to teach with those horrors floating around? Here, here, squeaked tiny Professor Flitwick, whose feet were dangling a foot from the ground. All the same, demurred Fudge. They're here to protect you all from something much worse. We all know what Black's capable of. Do you know, I still have trouble believing it, said Madame Rosmerta thoughtfully. Of all the people to go over to the dark side, Sirius Black was the last I would have thought. I mean, I remember him when he was a boy at Hogwarts. If you told me then what he was going to become, I'd have said you'd had too much mead. Rose Murta here, a fascinating character who shows up incidentally in the books, uh, shows up in this scene, basically, in the movies. Um, 
But I, I'm interested in this character because Rosmerta is a rare example of J.K. Rowling actually just lifting a name. She doesn't do this very often. Most of her characters have kind of corrupted, you know, playful names at least, right? But Rosmerta is just lifted directly and lifted directly from the the ancient French, the kind of Gallo-Romanic religions. In the Gallo-Romanic tradition, Rosmerta is a goddess of fertility and abundance. Her attributes are associated with those of the cornucopia. She is, is providential in that sense. She is a giver of food and comfort and life. She is, I mean, if you like, to borrow a phrase, she is something of a domestic goddess. Rosmerta is specifically uh, is specifically Gaulish. Smirch, the root word right there in the middle, means provider or carer, and the the row prefix modifier there means great or or is sometimes you know superlative to the degree of meaning meaning most. And then the a uh ending is the typical Gaulish feminine singular nominative, thus. The translation of Rosmerta is the great or great, uh, she who is the great or greatest provider. That is what Rosmerta means, and it is a perfect name, a perfect name for this character, for the host and owner of the three broomsticks. I completely love it there, yeah. Figure she'd be an innkeeper then, says Nicole. Absolutely, I love this detail. I, I just, yes, I don't know. Uh, Jess says, isn't anyone else confused that she was flirting with boys 30 years ago and is still fanciable to Ron? Um, I mean, Helen Mirren exists in the world, Sigourney Weaver exists in the world. I actually have no trouble with that at all. <laughs> Oh, Becca Eller is asking, can we have Rosmerta in the next Neil Gaiman book? So you're thinking that he's going to go and write European gods? I'm kind of into that. Yes. Good. Good. Okay. So that's our introduction to Rosmerta, who unfortunately, for all that her name is great and her role should be fantastic, exists within this scene simply to ask, but wait, who? And, but wasn't that the incident? And all of this. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we're calling out Sharon, so Helen Mirren. Yeah, see, I'm, I'm saying. Good. Good. Okay. So let's keep pushing on to our big reveal here. Sirius Black, it turns out, is Harry's godfather. You say you remembered him at Hogwarts, Rosmerta, murmured Professor McGonagall. Do you remember who his best friend was? Naturally, said Madame Rosmerta with a small laugh. Never saw one without the other, did you? The number of times I had them in here, oh, they used to make me laugh. Quite the double act, Sirius Black and James Potter. Harry dropped his tankard with a loud clunk. Ron kicked him. Precisely, said Professor McGonagall. Black and Potter, ringleaders of their little gang, both very bright, of course, exceptionally bright, in fact, but I don't think we've ever had such a pair of troublemakers. I don't know, chuckled Hagrid. Fred and George Weasley could give them a run for their money. You'd have thought Black and Potter were brothers, chimed in Professor Flitwick. Inseparable. Of course they were, said Fudge. Potter trusted Black beyond all his other friends. Nothing changed when they left school. Black was best man when James married Lily. Then they named him Godfather, a godfather to Harry. Harry has no idea. Of course, you can imagine how the idea would torment him. Hey, let's have this whole conversation here and never mention Remus Lupin. Let's do that, shall we? He definitely can't be in any way involved in this entire thing. This, to me, is one of the beats in the book that plays the least fair with the reader. We just... He should be here in the same breath as James and Sirius and Peter. We should have him referenced here. And the fact that we don't is, I mean, pretty narratively unforgivable there. Pretty narratively unforgivable. We're still just talking about incredibly attractive older women here in the YouTube chat, which is kind of making my heart glad. Um, <laughs> we've got Demi Moore is listed here. Uh, Susan Sarandon. Robin Wright Penn. I mean, my goodness. My goodness. Yeah. Okay. Back to Harry Potter. We've got to talk a little more about this. So, Black and Potter, Sirius and James, were thick as thieves. They were like brothers during their time at Hogwarts. And Sirius Black is Harry's godfather. This is vital, of course, because this verifies, this confirms our understanding that, yes, there has been something between Harry and Sirius that goes beyond Sirius's connection to Lord Voldemort and the death of his parents right from the beginning of the book. This kind of confirms Arthur Weasley's fear that Harry was going to go looking for him, or explains, at least, Arthur Weasley's fear that this was going to happen. But that's not all. Fudge dropped his voice and proceeded in a sort of low rumble, 
Not many people are aware that the Potters knew you-know-who was after them. Dumbledore, who was, of course, working tirelessly against you-know-who, had a number of useful spies. One of them tipped him off, and he alerted James and Lily at once. He advised them to go into hiding. Well, of course, you don't know, you know who wasn't an easy person to hide from. Dumbledore told them that their best chance was the Fidelia's charm. How does that work? said Madame Rosmerta, breathless with interest. Professor Flitwick cleared his throat. An immensely complex spell, he said squeakily, involving the magical concealment of a secret inside a single living soul. The information is hidden and inside the chosen person or secret keeper. It is henceforth impossible to find, unless, of course, the secret keeper chooses to divulge it. As long as the secret keeper refused to speak, you know who could search the village where Lily and James were staying for years and never find them, not even if he had his nose pressed against the sitting room window. So Black was the potter's secret keeper, whispered Madame Rosmerta. Naturally, said Professor McGonagall. James Potter told Dumbledore that Black would rather would die rather than tell where they were, that Black was planning to go into hiding himself, and yet Dumbledore remained worried. I remember him offering to be the Potter's secret keeper himself. He suspected Black, gasped Madame, gasped Madame Rosmerta. He was sure... Uh -uh. He was sure that somebody close to the Potters had been keeping you-know-who informed of their movements, said Professor McGonagall darkly. Indeed, he had suspected for some time that someone on our side had turned traitor and was passing a lot of information to you-know-who. So we see that they kind of remember, that Madame Rosmerta kind of remembers Sirius Black, but I guess this is different. We have moved past the point now of popular knowledge. We're moving into... Well, the realm of secrets, appropriately enough. This is why we, we uh, titled tonight's session Secret Keepers. Fidelis, that gives us the root of Fidelius, uh, means trustworthy or faithful. Fidelius is the comparative form of the word, so it means more trustworthy, more faithful. Fidelius means, yes, more trustworthy than things which are not the Fidelius charm, I guess. So it's not an absolute, it, it is not trustworthiest, but it is more trustworthy, more faithful. Fidelius, that's where that comes from, which I pretty much love. Um, let me see here in the YouTube chat. Yes, exactly. Emerging Puppy says, seriously, why are these people drinking together? It's like they all got together to specifically tell this exact story to Rosmerta, Brackets, and also Harry, who they probably knew was nearby. Yeah, yeah. Brian, has, uh, Brian asks, uh, why didn't Dumbles hide the Philosopher's Stone using the Fidelius charm burned once before, I guess? Yeah. Yeah, there are some serious questions about the use of the Fidelius charm, except that Professor Flitwick says, an immensely complex spell involving the magical concealment of a secret inside a single living soul. So firstly, Dumbledore would have to have someone else that he trusted, because presumably the casting of the spell, Dumbledore cast this Fidelius charm that kept Lily and James safe for as long as it kept Lily and James safe. He was the one who cast this, but I guess he could have been the secret keeper, so perhaps you can embody the secret within your own living soul, but it is an immensely complex spell, so perhaps it isn't something that is done trivially, something that is done simply, and perhaps it's not as reliable as everyone thinks. I don't know. I don't know. It's difficult when J.K. Rowling introduces a new element into our understanding of wizardry to not go back and kind of backfill our explanations of... of earlier encounters and earlier compromises here, yes. So this is all just simple backstory. This is all just raw exposition. This is this is the raw cookie dough of storytelling here. No, 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 no. We don't have time to bake it into actual cookies here. Just, just grab a spoon in the tub and, and go nuts, I guess. And that doesn't mean that the cookie dough is bad. It just means that perhaps it isn't the perfect idealized form of cookie dough, that is to say cookies. There you go. That's a metaphor that I just came up with right now, but I kind of like that, and we'll probably use that again in the future. This is the raw cookie dough of narrative, you guys. So we learn that not many people were aware the Potters knew you-know-who was after them. Dumbledore has spies within Voldemort's camp back during the last days of the First Wizarding War. Voldemort presumably also has spies in Dumbledore's camp. Dumbledore, as we see here, is distrustful. He had suspected for some time that someone on our side had turned traitor and was passing a lot of information to you-know-who. This is, you know, a kind of reciprocal betrayal that is going on here. Certainly we know who the good guys are and we know who the bad guys are, so we can perhaps judge these people very differently. But both sides are kind of leaking information to the other side. James and Lily have to go into hiding. We use the Fidelius charm to accomplish that, and we entrust Sirius Black, in theory, we entrust Sirius Black with the secret. But, um, okay, we're, we're actually skipping ahead here. I guess you've all, 
<laughs> You've all read the, the, the chapter. It's fine. Um, good. Uh, now we're just talking about cookie dough. You know, we're just talking about cookie dough in the YouTube channel. I have completely redale, uh, derailed, in fact, the uh, the conversation here. Now it's all just cookies. Oh, Leo is calling it quits. Falling asleep. Long day. Sorry. Good night. All good night, Leo. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes. <laughs> Oh, no, and Merging Puppy is introducing the notion of voting people off the chat, which seems like a very dangerous idea. I think that that uh, it all becomes a little big brother at that point, yeah. Okay, let's wrap up here. Uh, we, yes, we want to deal with Peter, as Jenna Cat says, and then there's Peter, and the jerk suspected Remus Lupin says heroes and bards. I know, I know. Uh, Jess says, have we, can we also discuss that she hadn't thought of auras yet? Thought She thought of here, meaning uh, J.K. Rowling's, you know, secondary creation? Yeah, yes. It's another element that's added later, but it's fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, here we go. A long silence followed Hagrid's story. Then Madame Rosmerta said with some satisfaction, but he didn't manage to disappear, did he? The Ministry of Magic caught up with him next day. Alas, if only we had, said Fudge bitterly. It was not we who found him. It was little Peter Pettigrew, another of Potter's friends, maddened by grief, no doubt, and knowing that Black had been the Potter's secret keeper, he went after Black himself. Pettigrew? That fat little boy who was always tagging around after them at Hogwarts, said Madame Rosmerta. Hero worshipped Black and Potter, said Professor McGonagall. Never quite in their league, talent-wise. I was often rather sharp with them. You can imagine how I... how I regret that now. She sounded as though she had a sudden head cold. There now, Minerva, said Fudge kindly. Pettigrew died a hero's death. Eyewitnesses, muggles, of course, we wiped their memories later, told us how Pettigrew cornered Black. They say he was sobbing, Lillian James, Sirius, how could you? Then he went for his wand. But of course, Black was quicker. Blew Pettigrew to smithereens. Professor McGonagall blew her nose and said thickly, Stupid boy. Foolish boy. He was always hopeless at dueling. He should have left it to the ministry. The final showdown between Peter Pettigrew and Sirius Black. More on that later. Yes, uh, Brian's calling out here. I really dislike Rowling's consistent fat shaming throughout the books, the Dursleys, Pettigrew, etc. Yes, it is pretty obnoxious. It is not that you can't or that you shouldn't have people of various body types, but when you use fat as an indicator for worthless or an indicator for lazy or an indicator for, you know, undeserving of trust, that is a problem, particularly when you do it completely consistently, which she does. It's, yeah, not great. Not great. There is, I, I believe, uh, by all means, correct me if I'm wrong on this, I believe that there is a one-to-one -one correlation between characters being fat and characters being objects of ridicule, if not outright villainy in, in Harry Potter. Yeah. Okay, let's wrap this up. I have no time left. I'm actually over time, and we need to conclude our chapter tonight. Madame Rosmerta let out a long sigh. Is it true he's mad, Minister? I wish I could say that he was, said Fudge slowly. I certainly believe his master's defeat unhinged him for a while. The murder of Pettigrew and all those muggles was the action of a cornered and desperate man, cruel, pointless. And I met Black on my last inspection of Azkaban. You know, most of the prisoners in there sit muttering to themselves in the dark. There's no sense in them. But I was shocked at how normal Black seemed. He spoke quite rationally to me. It was unnerving. You'd have thought he was merely bored. Asked if I'd finished with my newspaper. Cool as you please. Said he missed doing the crossword. Yes. I was astounded at how little effect the Dementors seemed to be having on him. And he was one of the most heavily guarded in the place, you know. Dementors outside his door, day and night. But what do you think he's broken out to do? said Madame Rosmerta. Good gracious, Minister, he isn't trying to rejoin you-know-who, is he? I dare say that is his uh, eventual plan, said Fudge evasively. But we hope to catch Black long before that. I must say you-know-who, alone and friendless, is one thing, but give him back his most devoted servant. And I shudder to think how quickly he'll rise again. When I said earlier that uh, that uh, we haven't quite figured out uh, Cornelius Fudge, this is a great indication. We'll return to this in later books. Uh, I guess we're asking to uh, we're, we're we're trying to quote some people, uh, trying to think of some people here who are who are rather more substantial. Uh, Hagrid is, but Hagrid also isn't completely human, so I'm not sure that we can count him. Uh, Molly Weasley, I suppose, is is yes, uh, is larger. So yes, but gosh, it, it is pretty tough. And and yes, it's it's not terror perhaps not exclusively consistent but yes not yes <laughs> okay 
I'm scrolling through. I think I think we're good. I think we're good there. Okay. Um, so yes, here we have the the visit of Cornelius Fudge to Azkaban and the suggestion that perhaps Sirius Black is less affected by the Dementors than we might expect him to be. Gee whiz, it's almost as though his story wasn't completely understood, as though perhaps he wasn't completely haunted by the terrible, terrible, terrible things that he had done. We'll come back to that later. Yes. Maybe Mishlad says, "Why does that's a great name?" Maybe Mishlad says, "Why does Fudge consider Black Voldemort's uh, Black Voldemort's most devoted servant compared to those who actually served openly or secretly as Death Eaters?" Yeah, that's an excellent question. Uh, certainly, Black's villainy seems to be unmatched, which is a little dubious. You know, uh, he is a traitor. He betrayed the Potters. And he murdered a bunch of uh, of muggles outright, not to mention Peter Pettigrew too. He is consistently listed as you know the most infamous mass murderer. He is consistently listed as the most you know notorious criminal. So that makes a certain amount of sense. So in terms of evil, perhaps we're kind of comparing him to to Voldemort here. But yes, uh, his most devoted servant seems questionable. There were certainly people who were more devoted to Voldemort during his reign than Sirius Black, even if Sirius Black is guilty of all that he has been accused of. That, though, is going to do it uh, for this week's session. All of this, by the way, is going to come back. We just have to acknowledge all of it now, take it as read, and then uh, push on. Next week, and I do mean next week, I was going to take next week off, but my schedule has been moved around. So next week, we're going to look at chapters 11 and 12 and one of my favorite chapters in the entire book, in the entire series. We're going to discuss the Firebolt first off. And then we're going to talk about the Patronus. That is at 10 p.m. Eastern, Tuesday, September the 12th. I hope you will all be able to join me. Thank you all so much for joining me tonight. Thank you for your patience here as I overrun my uh, my scheduled slot here for Dear Mr. Potter. But you know, sometimes there's just so much to talk about. Thank you all so much for joining me. I will talk to you all next week. In the meantime, you can get in touch with me over on Twitter using the hashtag Dear Mr. Potter, D-E-A-R-M-R-P-O-T-T-E-R. -T -T -E I will see your tweets there. Or you can email me directly at pointnorthmedia at gmail.com. That'll do it for this week. I'll talk to you all very soon. Until then, mischief man.